200 million copies in print, six made-for-television movies and series, and many, many books under her belt. My guest today has been speaking into the hearts and dreams of women for years now, and she's still driving hard and cranking out new work all the time. She's a legend in the publishing world and beloved by so many, and her faith has remained central in all she does. I'm Julie Lyles Carr. You're listening to the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does, and today I welcome Debbie McCumber. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Julie. Oh, thanks so much for being with us today. So tell my listeners who you are and where you live. I'm sure many of them already know, but I think they would want to hear it from you. Well, I'm a wife, mother, a daughter of the Lord, and I live in Port Orchard, Washington State. <laughs> Wonderful. And that little cop was my office dog. <laughs> I've got one of those myself who also tends to make some really interesting little noises from time to time. And how long have you lived in the area? Uh, we've been in Port Orchard, oh my goodness, uh, uh, 86, so 33 years. Wow, for quite a while. Did you grow up in the Pacific Northwest area or was that a place that you chose to go to? Uh, born and raised in the center of the state in a little town called Yakima. My husband was born and raised in a town called Colville, which is north of Spokane, that had one stoplight in the entire county. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. In the county. That's not even... <laughs> in the county. When we moved to Port Orchard, there was only one stoplight, and the population was 3,000, and now we're up to 14,000. So now you're just rocking it out in the big urban setting. I love it. <laughs> stoplights everywhere. Everywhere. More stoplights. Bring them on. Well, I know that my listeners are going to know you as a prolific author and someone who has provided voice and story to so many women through the years. But I think the way that you got started in writing is absolutely fascinating because you say that you really struggle with dyslexia. And a lot of times when we have someone who struggles in that way with language, with written language, it doesn't seem all of that you know, intuitive that someone would go on to become a writer. What was that journey like? Oh my goodness, you know, this is such a God thing. You have to believe in the Lord. You can think that somebody that didn't learn to read until they were in the fifth grade would become a best-selling author. Um, I've always been a storyteller, and I had to learn to be the writer. Um, I started when the kids were four little ones running around with a rented typewriter on our kitchen table. And I would write during the days and move the typewriter at mealtime. And it, I, it took me uh, five years to sell that first, uh, that first book. I wrote four manuscripts all the way through before I ever sold. Wow, wow. And you know, you hear that, that was part of my story in the nonfiction realm in terms of writing, but I, I just want people to really hear that again. When it comes to having a passion for writing, yes, there are those people that they just write that one thing, send it, immediately find the agent, it immediately gets a deal. But there are so many of us out there that have these long, long game kind of experiences in terms of how long it takes. How did you stay encouraged? Because there are a lot of mamas out there and they are working the side hustle and they're doing all the things and it just doesn't feel like they're coming to breakthrough. How did you stay encouraged to stay in that lane? Well, first of all, I want to address what you said about the person that sells quickly, you know, doesn't when I talk at writers' conferences, I say they have not suffered enough. Yeah. <laughs> because we have to suffer. We have to suffer for their art. And I and I think that that was the that five years that it took for me to sell my first book. I built a real foundation. I had to trust every single day, and I would pray over my computer. I would, or my typewriter. I had a little prayer that I said, and it was, "I believe I am divinely guided." I believe I will always take the right turn in the road, and I believe God will make a way where there is no way. And I would say that prayer, and then I would start writing. Mm, I love that. And how did you manage all of that with little kids around the house? Because, you know, sometimes we can have a passion for something and really love it, and we can feel that place that if it's not bringing in extra income to the family bottom line and all of those kinds of things, well, then should we really even be pursuing it? Or sometimes we can get so caught up in that thing that is a passion, whatever that is, that the kids almost seem to kind of be a pain and get in the way. So how did you balance chasing something you were passionate about before there was really income to justify it, but at the same time, make sure that those little kiddos were getting what they needed from you? I think so many of us women, when we pursue our God-given talents and our passion in our lives, feel guilty mm -hmm. that we are, you know, but I realized in retrospect that I was teaching our children some of the most valuable lessons of their lives. 
I taught them about the power of a dream, about believing in themselves, about not giving in to rejection, but to keep trying to be determined and follow your, God's will in your life. It was a, a long road, and I did feel guilty. And it, it was very hard in the summer times, and I worked a compromise with the kids. The mornings were theirs. We just had the most wonderful summers because every day I had something different for us to do together. Um, I, we did cooking together. We, I taught them all how to make bread and we made cookies and we did library day and we did science day. We had fun all summer and in the afternoons I would take them to the swimming pool and they would, I would leave them there for two hours and I would come home and I would write like a fiend. <laughs> I'd pick them up and because those two hours were mine. Right. You know, and they and they loved the pool. They had friends there and uh, it worked out great. I think you were such a strategist in that because I think sometimes as moms, if we feel like we really want to chase this thing, but we're kind of keeping the kids at arm's length or plop them in front of a screen or whatever the thing is, I love that you were so intentional about making that time that you were taking for you for pursuing the thing that you felt driven to do also turned into a fun time for them. And I think that is a really, really cool act of genius that there's a mom out there who needs to understand that, that it doesn't have to be an either or. It can be an enjoyable time that you take for yourself and for your kids if you can strategize just a little bit. Now I'm going to ask you to brag on yourself a little bit. I'm giving you permission. I want to know how many books, how many titles at this point, how many best sellers. Give me all the stats. I just, I just want to hear it. <laughs> well, to be honest, I don't know the number of books I've written, but I can tell you I've been over a thousand weeks on the New York Times list. I know that there are over 200 million copies of my books in print around the world. I know that I've had, I, I believe it is seven movies. I think I've had 13 number one New York Times bestsellers. Uh, I've had a TV series and I just recently signed an option for another TV series. So when you were sitting at that kitchen table with those little bitty kids with your rented typewriter, did you picture all this? Like, was this the goal you had in mind? It was above and beyond. You know, there's that scripture in Ephesians where it says, God will do above and beyond anything we can think or imagine. I, I have a great imagination. I have a very creative imagination. But I could have never have imagined that God would do this in my life. And, you know, some people, you know, with your faith being so strong, I think there are those who would say, well, if I have that kind of faith and I want to write, I need to write... Christian nonfiction that really helps tell people how to live their lives better or uncovers an issue they're having and helps solve it. How do you believe that fiction, because to my mind, beautiful fiction has the same kind of power that nonfiction does. I mean, a different type, but I think that it has its own power and can speak into spiritual places in very powerful ways. But did you ever feel that pull like, well, you know, I have this great faith in God. Should I be declaring more nonfiction kind of writing or how did you bridge that? Well, I'm a fiction writer, so nonfiction is really hard for me. I struggle with that. The real question was, would I write fiction in the Christian market or in the secular market? And God made it very clear to me that he wanted me writing in the secular field. And I can share my faith because you can't separate uh, the faith from the writer. I, you know, I'm one person. It's like I have brown eyes. You know, it, it, that's not going to change because I'm writing books. And so my faith comes through. I never, ever put a pastor in a bad light in my books. I never put church people in a bad light in my books. And uh, the stories I tell, Jesus was a storyteller. And he used parables. And so whenever I write a book, I look at it from through the eye of Scripture. What would happen? And we're, we're humans. We're fallible. We make mistakes. My characters are flawed. They have to be because they have to grow. Well, and I think it's fascinating that you went the secular lane in your writing because I think sometimes there's a real pressure on those of us in faith to take whatever creative gifts we have and only use them in a Christian market, which is a very interesting sort of possessiveness in a sense, because <laughs> if we are out there in the world making a difference, I, you know, there are those people who will come to a church or will seek spiritual guidance who might not otherwise when they hit a challenge in their life. But for a lot of people, they're probably not going to actively seek it. And if we're not out there in it, how on earth can we speak into it? 
And so I think it's so powerful to hear you distinguish that, that God made it clear you were to be in the secular market. How do you, how, what were the things that you saw that made that clear for you? Because we may have a listener who's really on the fence trying to figure out, am I supposed to be doing something in the quote unquote Christian marketplace or am I supposed to be doing something in the secular marketplace? Well, the first book I sold was actually Christian fiction. And I, the second book I sold was secular fiction. And I, I was asking God, which way should I go? And it was the secular fiction that got published first where I got my first success. The Christian fiction did not do well. And so I just felt this was God, this is the answer to that prayer that I was supposed to be. I don't need to preach to the choir. I don't live a perfect life. I'm a flawed human being. And so often in, I, in at that time, I don't think it's the same way now, but I know it's not. If you didn't write the perfect heroine who was, you know, it was like she was next to Jesus, you know, <laughs> you know, she was like Mrs. God, mm -hmm, <laughs> right, right. You know, then she, it wasn't acceptable, and I just couldn't write that kind of story. Right. I think that's really amazing to just follow the signs of life because I think God will show direction through that when we're willing to look. Why do you think that the romance genre and the women's fiction genre, it continues to grow, it continues to accelerate, even though I think at times, and of course it's, it's definitely something that is morphing over time, but sometimes it has seemed almost at odds with some of the message that we're receiving as modern women about being independent and strong and, and all of that. And so why do you think that that genre, those two genres continue to grow the way they do? I mean, they are the backbone of the publishing world, according to statistics. Yeah. Oh, that's true. I, I heard a statistic recently that said that 75% of all books are bought by women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned that to my husband. And he kind of snorted and said, Debbie, 75% of everything is bought by a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so, I, I think that really there is more time for women to read now. And I think we need that. We need to be fed that. And um, the, my heroines are strong. I don't write weak heroines. They don't look for a man to rescue them. They look to God in, in different ways, you know. And so it's about life. I have to write about real life. I have a, because I'm a storyteller, I have some words that I use, and two of them are provocative and relevant. I want my readers to think, uh, and it has to be relevant to their lives. And they're not going to live, you know, my heroines don't live perfect lives, but they're strong and they find a way out. I love that. I think to be provocative and relevant in this generation is so important because that's, those are the voices we're looking for. Those voices that are willing to change things, those voices that are addressing things that are current and are the things that we experience today. And I think that has absolutely played into your continued success and all of the years that you have been speaking into the lives of women. We'll get right back to the interview in just a moment. You may have noticed at the top of the show or at the end of the show, I'm always encouraging you to go check out something. It's called All Mom Does. And I just want to make sure that you're taking advantage of this amazing resource for the journey you're on when it comes to your kids, your marriage, your spiritual life, your job, your relationships. All Mom Does is this incredible community of women just like you walking through so many of the same things. And you can go on allmomdoes.com. You'll find all kinds of fantastic blog posts, great information, but also check out All Mom Does on the socials because there's such an incredible community that is developed there. Women encouraging women, women sharing their lives. So so be sure and check it out. I know you hear it at the top and the end of the show, but it's so important. I had to just stop right here and mention again to you, go to allmomdoes.com and allmomdoes on Instagram and Facebook. You're going to find friendship, inspiration, and so much more. You've spoken about your faith and bringing that to your creativity in the secular publishing marketplace. And I have had friends who have tried to publish in that genre and have been told, nope, you have not written hot enough sex scenes, you got to go back to the drawing board. And they've wrestled with how to tell modern stories and yet at the same time honor their convictions. And it is said that, you know, you don't write sex scenes, you write sensual scenes, but not sex scenes. How did you arrive at that conclusion? And how have you found that to be received by publishers? I have never had a problem with any publisher ever telling me that I've had to increase the sexuality in my books. And that's because I, they know me. And um, I have never had readers say that they've, in fact, they said they appreciate it. I, I joke around and then I say, 
you know, people say, well, how come you don't have sex in your books? And I'll say, it's because I'm married. I don't know that much. <laughs> you just, you know, you just got your one story. What are you going to do? I mean, we're not going to take a field trip on this or anything. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> you know, some of them read, like, you know, instruction manuals. Yeah, you yeah, know? exactly. They do. I mean, you know, and it is, it is very interesting to find those things that are inserted into books that you kind of go, I don't even know if that had to be part of the story, and I don't mean that from a Puritan place. I mean it from a place of why was that there at that time, and was that necessary? And I do think as a culture, we have almost hit a place. It's it's kind of like on movies where they'll have to throw in a word or two to get a certain rating because they know that that will potentially increase the attractiveness of the movie to moviegoers. Oh, a PG, well, it's probably a kid movie. PG-13, let's go. And so I do think it's interesting. People need to be aware that sometimes things are put into books, into movies, into music, not because artistically it's the right choice, but because there is a desire that maybe it'll make it seem a little more marketable or a little more provocative, and that's why it's there. So I, I salute you that you have been able to continue to create and write within this space and not have to feel the pressure or be asked to continue to put those kind of things in if it interferes with the convictions that you have. I love that. What do you think the value of women's stories is? What, what do we learn from them? How do they shape our understanding of who we are designed to be? Talk to us about that. Well, I think we all have a need to, to relax, to de-stress, and there's just so much stress in this world. Uh, I think if we can involve ourselves into uh, a story, it kind of relieves that, and we all need that kind of stress relief, and we need a, a, a place where we can go, and you know, like a, a lot of people will write and say, I'm not able to travel, but I love visiting your state, because mm -hmm. I write a lot about Washington State. You know, so it's it. I think it's just a, a need that that God put into our lives, into into us as our as His created beings. That the need. First of all, I think we all need story. If you if you go to a uh, listen to sermons, what you'll remember are the stories. And uh, I think the need for story is just inbred in us. We do seem to have brains, and I read some recent studies on it that our brains are wired to remember via story, that that really is the best learning tool for us. And of course, it's the one that Jesus instituted and, and made right. part of how he taught and, and why people remember his stories to this day, even if they don't follow scripture. They oftentimes know some of the stories that he told and use them as metaphors. So you've been writing for a lot of years now. I mean, I won't, I won't out you, but I, I have an idea of about how, uh, how that might mean in terms of birthdays, knowing that you started writing at 35 and knowing how long the career has now been. So how are you staying intentional to address the issues for women today? Because, you know, sometimes I think we can get to a place where we've lived some life, we figured some stuff out, and we don't really necessarily feel a need to dive into all the issues of the generations that are coming up underneath us. How do you stay intentional to make sure you are still speaking into the todays of your readers for today? Well, that's really interesting because I have generational readers now. Right. That, well, you know, because like I would say the cell phone and, and uh, my generational reader will say, no, no, no person my age would say cell phone. They would just say phone because they don't know anything other than a cell phone. Right. right. Um, I was playing a game with one of my grandkids and uh, was a, a little sack of um, little metal things and they would put their hand in and draw it out and they'd have to tell a story about it. And my grandson brought out a little toy uh, typewriter and he looked at me and he said, what's this grandma? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. He had no idea what it was and that was like 10 years ago. Right, right. So, you know, I, I try to make the stories as relevant to my audience as possible, but then I have them read by somebody in the younger generations to make sure that it aligns with that any person, any age could read it. I love that. I've been in women's ministry for a number of years now, and and I do have several people on my team who are younger than I am that when I have an idea or a teaching or something that I think I'm supposed to bring, I take it back to them and go, does this hit the mark? Because these are issues that I was facing when I was in the season you're in with kids the ages your kids are and in those early stages of my career and my husband's career. But things have shifted enough now. I just want to make sure that I'm hitting the mark. So I love that you take it back and you vet it with, with readers who can take a look and let you know, hey, let's not say cell phone. <laughs> That's yeah. great. 
What has changed from when you first started with your writing career? Changed with audience? Changed with the process of submitting manuscripts? Changed with your process and how you work through getting those books onto paper? You know, it is even hard to address that question because there have been so many changes. I mean, when I started out, there, you know, I was a typewriter. Right. And publishing was a man's world. And for women to break in was tough. In fact, um, if you look at the bestseller list today of women my age that are the bestsellers on the New York Times, they all came through the door marked romance because that was the only door open to us. So now it is much more of a woman's world than it is a man's world. I mean, the big boys are out there. Right. Um, we would submit it through a, um, uh, you could also, um, you could submit your manuscripts directly to the publisher. That's no longer the case. You have to go through an agent. And uh, agents now, are it's a very catch-22. You can't uh, get an agent until you sell a book. You can't sell a book till you get an agent. So right. uh, Amazon has changed everything with the uh, e-reader, you don't have to have a publisher, a traditional publisher anymore to uh, get your book out into the market. And that has just opened more doors than you can imagine. It really is fascinating to hear those who have gone that route, who have really focused through Amazon Kindle or through Kobe or through other platforms that, you know, you, you really can kick down a door, if you will, that did exist for a while where you had to have the agent to get to the traditional publishing. But it is fascinating and exciting to see that what it, there's an author who talks about choose yourself, you know, pick yourself, decide that you're the one, you are a writer. It doesn't, you know, you don't have to go the traditional route and to see what can happen within that. And then to see some of the things that are coming up within some of those e-readers that can be really fun. I don't know how much they will be embraced completely, but links that take you to different things, videos that can be embedded into some of the books. I mean, there's, it's kind of a really interesting world right now to see where we're going to head in terms of storytelling. I, I found a reader or an author just recently that I so enjoyed that the books were YA books. Yes. Uh -huh. All of her books were set in Washington State, and I really liked the writing. The stories are very creative. So I sent her an email just to, to ask her first if she was in Washington State, and so I got a, an email back right away. And it was, uh, they lived in the town next to me. Oh, wow. Don't throw away, and she was a he. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just find all kinds of, of young writers out there, young what I say in book years, and I love to be an encourager to them because they're our future. Right, right. You know, and if you can encourage them and steer them in the right path. It's, it's profound. I mean, it's, it's what becomes legacy when you have that ability to speak into those who are coming up after you. And I, I love what you say about book years. That is really a great way of looking at it because sometimes <laughs> I think we try to monitor how we think our success is and the passion that we have based on our actual chronological age and have we gotten as far as we had hoped by that chronological age. Yeah. And yet I was reading recently about some best-selling authors who didn't even bust into the publishing world until they were in their late 50s, mid 60s, some 70 and beyond. And I thought, oh, I like that, what you said <laughs> about book years, because that just sort of takes the pressure off the chronological age to continue to pursue and see what you want to do with this desire that you have to tell stories. I think that's a really beautiful thing. Now you mentioned that nonfiction can be hard for you and yet you have put out a devotional. So talk to us about that because here you are with these beautiful stories and, and loving that fiction lane and, and publishing within the secular marketplace, but now you also have this devotional. So tell me about Be A Blessing. It's more of a journal than it is a devotional. Great, okay. And. Um, yeah, I've kept journals my entire life, and it just uh, my publisher had wanted me to to publish a journal, and uh, I wanted to be. I really prayed hard about this because what 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 could I put in a journal? So it came about that my mission statement, which I I found early on in my career, I was listening to all these motivational tapes that were talking about the importance of a mission statement. And I started writing all the things I wanted to do in my career down. And this is very early on. And I had this tremendous list of all things that evolved around me. I wanted to do this. I wanted to be a best-selling lawyer. I wanted to go on tour. Blah, 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 blah. And I looked at that list, and all I could see was me, 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 me. And I didn't want my career to be about that. And so I just, I just prayed, and I said, God, I need a mission statement. Help me to find it. 
and it comes no surprise, I found it in scripture, when God made his covenant with Abraham, he said, I will make you a blessing. Mm -hmm. And so that has been my mission statement for over 30 years, that my books would be a blessing to others, that um, I, the stories would touch their hearts and lead them to God. So when I came to the journal, I wanted it to be a blessing. And so I took the fruits of the spirit, which is something I've been wanting to do for years and years and years. And I put it in the form of a garden. And I was, I was still trying to uh, struggling with how to do this. And I had lunch with a friend who had a bullet journal. And she's so creative and so artistic. And she, she showed me her bullet journal where she had made a goal, a, a monthly goal for herself and how she filled in each day. And she had pictures and artwork and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really good with verbs and nouns, but I have no artistic talent. And I thought, there's got to be people like other people like me who would love to do like a bullet journal, but don't have that talent. So I gave them the art already included, some pictures for them to color in themselves because the book is geared towards somebody that wants to express their creativity. And then following each one of the sections is like a planting a garden and they're outlined by the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So you're planning a garden and you're going through the journal. And so it's a little self work effort there as you work through and plant those fruits in your life. I think that's amazing. And you know, we have said to our kids through the years, we have eight children and any time that we get ready for them to go be with friends or Mike and I are heading out to go do something or whatever, we'll say, okay, now be a, and they know to say, blessing be a blessing now except for my youngest who he for some reason kept missing the memo daddy i don't know what the deal was but i would say <laughs> okay jake daddy and i are gonna head out i want you to be a and he would go um boy i'm like we're getting closer you know <laughs> <laughs> you got the alliteration down i mean we're getting close <laughs> so i love the title of this guided journal and i think it's going to be so powerful for people to get to have this experience and see how you yourself have journaled through the years and looked for those signs from God, those words from God, those leadings from God in such a way that helps people get to a place of experiencing being a blessing to others in their own lives. I think that's wonderful. So what else do you have on the horizon? I have a feeling that there is something always cooking in that noggin of yours. So what's the next <laughs> big passion project for you? Well, I have another book coming out this summer called uh, A Window on the Bay. And uh, another book coming out in October called A Mrs. Miracle Christmas. Now, I find this really interesting. The, the books that have been the most successful stories for me are ones I found while I was in Scripture. Okay. Like, Surely Goodness and Mercy from the 23rd Psalm mm -hmm. became angels Very and cool. prayer ambassadors. And so, and Mrs. Miracle is, comes from Hebrews 13, too, where we entertain angels unaware. So, and uh, a book called Girl's Guide to Moving On is the retelling of the, of the book of Ruth. I love that. So, I love so, that. So, some of my best ideas come right from the scripture. Right, right. And I love, too, that there are people who are reading those who who don't know that that scriptural reference is there, but but I love that the rhythm of the stories of God's people are getting in their hearts because of the way that you've got it connected. I think that's just spectacular. Well, I just can't thank you enough, Debbie, for being with us this morning, for our listeners to get to hear from you. I just think they're gonna be so excited. And I will certainly be thinking of you often, particularly as we head into that Christmas season, some of those Christmas movies start up again, where we get to see more of your work actually played out on the screen. So thank you so much for all you do and for sharing your heart and thoughts with us today. Oh, thank you, Julia. It was a lot of fun. Check out our show notes where you can connect with our guest and find out more. Do me a favor and subscribe and share the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from and leave a five-star rating and review. It helps get the word out about the podcast and I thank you so much. Connect with me, particularly over on Instagram. I love me the grams. I'm Julie Lyles Carr there. I'm so thankful to interact with listeners each week. I just love it. So head on over and say hi. Thank you. Thank you to Rebecca, our content coordinator, and Donna, our producer, the dynamic duo who make this podcast possible. Go to allmomdoes.com for an awesome resource and community for women walking through many of the same things you do with 
kids and spouses and work and faith. It's such a great place for you to connect and refresh. I'll see you next week with another fantastic episode of the Modern Motherhood Podcast.